This week's Four Wheels Good goes stateside. A flight to America reveals many differences on the roads. The roads to the local shops are five lanes. Mini cars are 30 foot long. Police officers travel with pump action shotguns. And in California, erring motorists don't have points on their license. They have to attend road safety school taught by a comedy cop. Here, teacher Mike Muffins explains what you should do if you encounter a UFO. Don't go into the light. Okay. <laughs> now, there was something painted on the pavement. You said, well, what does that say? It says, no bozos, okay? Each of us must read this and determine whether or not this applies to us as a driver. I personally throw on the brakes. Yuck! So why are you here? What did I do wrong, you mean? I ran a stop sign. I did a California roll. What's that? It's where you don't quite come to a complete stop at a stop sign. Well, there are much worse things happening out on the freeways. Yes, we get a lot of uh, reports of people throwing things at other cars. Um, we get reports of uh, accidents that were caused because one person was swerving at another because somebody upset them. Uh, we even go as far as getting people pointing guns at other people and, and actually shooting people because they're upset of an incident that happened on the highway. My favorite one, before I became a teacher, was throwing the golf balls out the sunroof. You know, it leaves those dings. You know, how many of you like to do that? That's wrong, they told me that was wrong and that I should not teach that. I went to Travis School once before and it was an ex-cop. And he wasn't funny at all, so that eight hours in his class was you know, really hard to take. Mike Muffins has attempted to re-educate some rather difficult offenders. He first promised that he would always shoot straight up in the air from now on. <laughs> and I said, that's, that's wrong. You don't know that's wrong? He said, what's wrong with that? There's nobody up there. I said, well, first of all, there might be somebody up there. We haven't determined that yet. But let's not get metaphysical. I said, what about the bullet coming down and killing people? He said, it'll do that? I mean, he was just, I just really educated him. But, you know, the bullet will come down. I said, uh, yeah, it comes down and kills people. So he said, oh, boy, he promised me that he would not do that anymore. And I gave him a certificate. <laughs> Gary Oldenburg from the Californian Highway Patrol practices with his sidearm, but hasn't had to use it yet on duty. He's waved it from time to time to stop a fleeing freeway felon, but most of the time it's his ballpoint that's unholstered. He meets a lot of beautiful Californians. Is he ever tempted by the charms of the female variety? Do they get away with things? You know, I have a little motto, and I've heard a lot of the other guys talk the same way. We don't give the pretty ones a break. In fact, I don't like to give people a break if I stopped them anyway. But we don't give the pretty ones a break because we feel that they've been getting breaks all their lives. I have bad luck with police officers. <laughs> they don't believe my tears. <laughs> and I said, I see. Clearly, he wants this space. Why? I may never know. Put my blinker on, I move over, and he comes too right behind me and snuggles up a little bit. And I became angry. At that point, there was a, a, a mean Mr. Muffins and a good Mr. Muffins that popped up. <laughs> okay, get the golf balls. No. You know? I said, no, I owe this to my students. I felt that in my heart. And I said, I'm going to do what they told me to do. Take my foot up off the gas, become less fun to be behind. And I did. And he hit me with those lights. You know the lights where you can see your bones projected onto your clothes? <laughs> ha! You can cream him now! No! I said, all right, took my foot up off the gas. It was at that point that I did something I shouldn't have done. Would now, you no, if I tell you, promise me you won't do it? Them no, it's my favorite thing. As he went by, I did this. Ha! <laughs> 
But I, he almost had a stroke. I watched his blood pressure go up. He went, I, that means I'm a total moron. I never even knew he was there. He wasted five minutes on me. He was humiliated in front of all of his friends. I just think it's the biggest waste of human resources there are to have people sit around for eight hours and not learn anything. And you, you'd like Mr. Muffins to hurry it along a bit? I'd like this whole nightmare to be over and done with so I can go out and break some more speeding laws, I think. They can run, but they can't hide. Gary and his fellow CHIPS officers can patiently write out as many tickets as fast as they can pull the offenders over. Maybe they all want to enjoy a free comedy show from Mr. Muffins. Paris? Marseille, perhaps? Actually, San Francisco and the eccentric members of the Arcane Auto Society. But behind every offbeat classic, a sound reason. On est français. Ma mère, elle est française, et j'adore la France. And uh, that's the biggest reason. I, and I feel a kinship to uh, the French, and I am Francophile completely. We bought this in northern Germany, and we took it directly to the boat and shipped it to the U.S. So it was brand new when we got it here. I bought it 21 years ago in the Dordogne region of France, and I looked up the old farmer that I bought it from. He's 75 years old now. It was 21 years to the week that I bought the car. I showed him pictures of the car, and he was very excited that we came to see him, and we had a great time. French cars are the most wonderful thing to collect because you can drive them and show off. The Arcane's English fans aren't averse to showing off either. No stiff upper lips here. British cars do something for me that I can't quite explain. I've had German cars and American cars and Italian cars, but uh, my first love is English cars. They, they smell right, they drive right, they're just right. But some of them didn't sell too well in California. What they said was made by thousands, sold by the half dozen. Everybody likes it, it's cute. It's, it's a cute little car. But there are cuter and littler cars in the Arcane Club. This one that I have now is actually a really rare one because they only made 50 of them. And it's a, a complete convertible and it's bubble window and I love it. It's great, lots of fun. I've seen people walk into poles while they're looking at me in my car and um, sort of get close to my car while they're driving and, and things like that. So I have to be extra careful while I'm driving, but um, it's fun. Well, to be a member of the Arcane Auto Society, you need to have a car that is so unusual that the average person would say, what is that? What kind of a car is that? Which is why we have our slogan on our shirts. President's duties is to be the only person that does anything and has to write the newsletter and make all the phone calls and sit down and say, we haven't done anything in a couple of months. I wonder where we should go next. And one particular member has a much wider choice of where to go than the others. About 10 years ago, 83, we had a huge flood and I lost my car. It doesn't float for five days. The Volkswagens float, but not that long. And the joke was that I needed to get one of these um, amphibious cars. And one night, a friend of mine called up and said, found one for you in the Sacramento Bee. Go down there, to, you know, give him a call. So I did and found that. It's, it's not a very good car and it's not a very good boat. Um, it handles basically like a 1950s uh, European car, which is to say a lot of oversteer, swing axles, sort of rear engine, um, terrible brakes, and then it handles about like that in the water, and I um, love it. <laughs> Well, let's face it, these days most cars are just boring. And on a beautiful Southern California day like today, what I wouldn't give to have a real American muscle car. You know, that's why I love America. All your dreams come true. Ask for a muscle car, you get a muscle car. About 30 years ago, a man named Carroll Shelby made a lot of friends and a lot of money by building high-performance versions of the classic Ford Mustang. And today, another man from Southern California, Steve Celine, is doing the very same thing. Ah, now, this is what all cars should sound like. About 15 years ago, Steve Celine, a former Indy car racer and race car engineer, started Celine Mustang in Southern California. These days, he takes a totally stock Mustang like this one and works all sorts of magic to it. Works on convertibles and hardtops alike until he comes up with this 510 horsepower of supercharged V8 monster muscle American style. It's about $60,000, about 40,000 pounds. If you can't afford that, you could get 
half the power for about half the price in the S281. This is the heart of the top of the line Celine Mustang, a good old American pushrod V8 5.8 liter 351 cubic inch engine that produces 510 horsepower. Imagine that 510 horsepower from a street legal engine. It's called the Ford Windsor engine. I guess you could say it is the royalty of the Ford engine lineup. Imagine taking this car out to Santa Pod or York for a quick quarter mile, which it will do in about 12 and a half seconds with street tires on it. Again, completely street legal. <laughs> Now, if you don't have $60,000 to buy a brand new Celine S351 Mustang, and I know I don't, I'm only a television presenter, you could call Celine at their shop here in Irvine, California, and build a Celine Mustang with all the parts they sell just about from the ground up. It's a traditional American hot rod shop. And like a traditional American hot rod and muscle car company, Celine also runs a race team. And they may be competing next year at Le Mans in the GT2 class. One of the drivers is Tim Allen, the star of television's home improvement. Tim brings a lot of money and a lot of prestige to the team. Disney, which produces Produces that television show as the main sponsor of the Celine Allen race team. I talked with Brian Murray, who's the director of marketing for Celine, about the company's philosophy. We're a small volume manufacturer that produces a special Mustang, or I should say a super high performance Mustang, that's sold exclusively through four dealerships. We produce anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 units per year. We do produce two models. One is what we call the S281, which is our entry level version which starts off at $28,000 U.S. dollars. Um, secondly is our 351, which is our 510 horsepower supercar, which retails for 52 and above. Currently our distribution is in North America only, in the U.S. and Canada. We are currently, though, looking to expand to the European market. I think the first phase of that will be our entrance next year in the 24 Hours of Le Mans and a few other endurance championships on the European continent. You can still take a Ford Mustang and turn it into an authentic muscle car. Steve Celine has proven that with the S351. The engine, the steering, the braking, the transmission, the suspension, all upgraded, all improved, all much tighter, and certainly more performance oriented than a stock Mustang right from the factory. Now, is it worth $60,000? Well, that's a question only you can answer. But if you want to buy a limited edition American muscle car that's really a modern day version of the original muscle car, the Pontiac GTO, this is probably the one to buy. And you know what? It does a pretty good job of acting like an authentic American V8 muscle car. You've got very few complaints about the car, and you even get about 20 miles per gallon. How could you argue with that? But at $60,000, who cares about the mileage? And you know, it just occurs to me, it's probably raining where you are, and I'm driving a Celine Mustang convertible in Southern California, and well, you're not. Sorry. Here in Los Angeles, well, we are trying to attract all the bad guys. The kids that are out there doing wrong, we get them down here, turn them on to racing, and we get them occupied in doing something positive. The Brotherhood Raceway in Los Angeles Dockland at Long Beach. Neutral territory for street gangs, it's an organized alternative to illegal street races, but there's still a healthy rivalry. Racing is so magical. It can actually take a kid, take the violence out of the kid. Because the violence is under the hood. You know, the motorcycles and the hot rods and the, the four-wheel drive machines and the low riders hopping and flaming. I mean, this gives the kids a way to get rid of that energy so that way they don't go to the streets, the public streets, and do wrong. On a Saturday night, we attract between three to 6,000 kids coming from all over Southern California. He's nine years old. He's got word in And our policy, not like all normal racetracks, we let half the kids in free. If you don't have any money, we still let you in. In other words, it's not about dollars. It's about getting you in here and getting you out of trouble. And so that's why we number one program, because it's working. I'm the president of the National and International Brotherhood of Street Racers. And uh, it's a nonprofit corporation. 
And our goal is to set up Brotherhood Raceways throughout the world. And the main purpose is bringing people together. We want to end racism. True racing, that's the main goal of the Brotherhood of Street Racers. Good bit of traction problem for that car right at the starting line. Smoking the tires, doing his burnout. For this country's small but dedicated branch of the international street racers, Big Willie has a special message. My English street racers, they are really mad at me. Because they said, Big Willie, you have yet to come over here and organize a good run with your brung event and bring your machines. And so I'm looking to come as soon as possible. I got to call the John Wolf Racing Team. They are my, my main organizers. And I got to call them and find out from them when would be the best month to come. But I'm going to try. I mean, don't give up on me. By day, nothing special. But by night, it's cruising time. This is the Wiener Schnitzel Takeaway in Laguna Hill, Southern California. On Thursday nights, visitors get a free side dish of American graffiti with their hot dogs. Oh, what are we riding in, Steve? I've uh, never known anything like it. It's a 32 Ford Highboy with a uh, 525 cubic inch Keith Black. Uh huh. This is actually a dragster motor. It's a top fuel motor that's been detuned for the street. Yeah. It makes about a thousand horsepower. Oh, well, that's <laughs> that's too <detuned. laughs> <laughs> And some of this styling is very uh, distinctive. Yes, it has it completely digital, and um, the car is capable of about 200 miles an hour. And we think it would run the quarter in about 750s, really? maybe 130 or 40. Well, that's faster than I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've Can we go the, and try it now? Well, the car would easily run 150, 160, really? just real quick on the freeway. Yeah. What year's your Corvette? It's a 1960. Uh-huh, and how long have you had it? I've had it 25 years. Loved and looked after and nurtured all that yeah. time? Part of the family. It's a 1954 two-door ranch wagon. It started out as a Mustang engine. It's been bored out to a 302 with a large cam, a racing cam if I wanted to race, but it's obviously too heavy a car to race. And a little elderly. Many cruisers were granddad's first car. Forrest, this is one pretty Mustang, but what's so special about it? Well, it's a uh, GT. Uh, they made a limited number of GTs in 1966. Uh -huh. And uh, How the, long have you had it? Um, my son bought it when he was 16, and um, we've had it in the family ever since. With amazing paintwork like this, you must be really worried about people side-swiping you, mustn't you? Oh yeah, it draws attention. People get too close to the cars you're driving on the road. In fact, it even attracts cars without drivers. I got rear-ended one time with a car that didn't have a driver in it. Um, somebody got out of the car, left the car in gear, and it took off and hit my car. Lots of gobsmacking cars, and every time I turned my back, another one drove up. What is this? This is a Dodge. <laughs> yeah, but the Dodges and Dodges. Uh, 1934 Dodge. It's a five window that was made into a roadster. As far as I know, it's the only one around. It's and what's this very much polished large lump at the front? That's a 671 uh, blower. It's got two carburetors and it's pushing about 500 horses. Regular cruises don't happen by accident, and this cruise was the brainchild of one person. Something I've always loved is the 50s, so it's something I decided to try. And with that, it was a very slow start, getting the cars to come out. Um, before you knew it, I had everybody coming out. One told another, another told another, and it grew into something very big for me, which has gone beyond all belief for me. Now, Rich plays host to unbelievable cars prepared with incredible care by loving enthusiasts. Well, this wood looks as though it's been restored more than once or twice. What kind uh, of problems does that give you? A lot of problems. It dries out. Uh, water. You don't, you don't like, wood don't like water unless it's real varnished. Termites? Termites I don't like to talk about, but I have had my problems. <laughs> oh dear. 
Yeah. And um, a little bird told me you've had a couple of other problems with this car too. Uh, yeah, it tried to run over me here a couple of months ago. What did you do to it to make it do that? Well, I'm building another car. So my friends keep saying that I'm bringing this new car into the garage and she jealous. doesn't like it no more. I told her, I said, I'll never get rid of her, so I'll, I'll always have it. And it'll always be cruise night somewhere. Right across America, there are hundreds of cruises every night. All it takes is a bright idea, a big car park, nice people with gorgeous cars, and lots and lots of lovely weather. Meanwhile, the other side of town, the Valley Parkers at the Peninsula Hotel Beverly Hills are raking in 200 pounds a night in tips alone because top movie deals are being made at this hotel while the Valley Parkers look after the limo. It's all fun because you're meeting and communicating and reacting with all the people. So the communication and, and being interactive with all the different kinds of caliber of people is fun, great fun. And of course you could say, hey, I've uh, driven Clint Eastwood's car. That has happened, yeah. We've driven about everybody's car. You wouldn't wash your hands afterwards, would you? The Peninsula is home to LA's top power bar. So the staff really do rub shoulders with the stars. Get to know them as friends. I know you by the first name, first name basis. Hi Steve, how you doing today? You know, welcome back. How are you today, Mr. Bowie, or whoever it's gonna be? I'm a fan of a Porsche 911, those Carreras, or Mercedes SEL or SEs. I don't quite know the model number, but they're all great. We become a master of parking after a while in this business. You tend to be able to find any spot in the street, and you'll get into it already. Tinseltown's inhabitants are noted for their uninhibited behavior. Does any hanky-panky happen on the back seats? Mm, it's happened. We've been accused of it. But, you know, you to each their own. I can always, I can say no, but I don't know what they do. You know, they're in the car about five minutes by themselves. They can snoop around or find, but, you know, hopefully not. Try not to allow that or policies. But. The job basically is great fun. It's a lot of hustling. You know, there's times where it's frustrating you guys stand aside and take a deep breath because you have a line of cars, you got to get them all out. Basically, the, uh, the uh, job in general and overall view is very fun, just in the communication of being with people and camaraderie of the guys and the hotel business. Very service-oriented, all positive aspects of life. Um, you know, but then you deal with the negative aspects also, maybe a fender bender or luggage that took too long to get out of the car or something of that nature. But the whole job in general is very fun. Every few months, Southern California's car enthusiasts converge on the town of Pomona. They're there for what Americans call a swap meet. But this isn't your common or garden auto jumble. 70,000 people, 12 miles of motors, it's California car heaven. This car heaven is all things to all people. For the buyer, a chance to pick up a 450 horsepower hot rod at a bargain price. For the seller, an opportunity to raise cash from a garage load of junk. For the exhibitionist, a chance for some serious showing off. And for the idol, some of the best people watching in California. With California still in recession, it's a buyer's market at Pomona. One after the other, for sale signs declare a willingness to accept the day's best offer. And it's a long day for sellers. When you show a vehicle, this is what they want to see. They want to see the whole vehicle and what's been done to it. This is how I show off what I've done to it and stuff. There's over $50,000 in, you know, work done to the truck. $30,000 is, you know, that's that's not a bad price to ask for a truck that's got $50,000 worth of stuff into it. So why, is, are you losing $20,000? I'm losing $20,000 on this just because I, you know, I, I feel that, you know, it's a bad time right now, it's a bad market. I, I want to sell it and I want to move on to other things. Yeah. So I'm willing to take a loss. A lavatory for the Winnebago, a back seat for the Coupe de Ville, or an ashtray for a 66 Mustang. You'll find them here, or you won't find them at all. I could probably go about 200 bucks. Bottom line would be 200 bucks. That's for a 64. Yeah, 63 to 67 are all the same. Uh, right and left, 200 bucks now take some home. Armrest. Armrest for the pair, $40. David, how's business today? Business is really good. I'm very happy for the weather. It's beautiful out here. Uh, I've got a really good corner spot. I've got good traffic. And uh, I normally bring some nice junk. What sells really well here? Um, 
Well, it's all Corvette stuff, and it's the earlier, the harder to find, that's what sells. The more rare, the more hard to find, just stuff that's been discontinued for years. So where do you find it? I find it in people's garages, and I find it in junkyards, and I find it just a little bit everywhere. Do you think people buy the stuff for actual use, or do people tend to gather up stuff and put it in their own garage, then you come and find it again, and all gets recycled? Yes, it is definitely a big cycling thing, because I sell a lot of stuff to other vendors, and then I see them again at another swap meet selling my stuff, and I often wonder if it ever ends up on somebody's car. And out along the miles of aisles, there are lots of pet projects that people never quite got round to. On swap meet day, Pomona's center aisle becomes busier than many a British high street, as dinky novelties vie for attention with big muscle street cred. After a few hours of beer, barbecue and buying, there's a trail of serious goodies heading for the car park. Yeah, six o'clock. Oh, that's before it was that's light. Much, my feet hurt. <laughs> so is this something well, from today? Yes, yes. yes. And what's it going to go into? It's going to go in my 62 Impala. Whoa, Oh very yeah. nice. Big time, huh? Yeah. Is it really going to go in there? Or oh, is it yeah. Go in a... No, no, it's really going in. First floor. Great. Well, have fun putting it all together. Oh, yeah. Thank <laughs> What are the prices like? Did you get a good deal? Yeah, pretty good. This one was, uh, I think, 20. This Have one was 15, then the hood was 20. Oh, it's not bad, not bad. So all in all, I spent about, I'd say about 150. Yeah, did you have to shop around a lot to find what you wanted? Well, the, for the hood and the two fenders were at the same place. Uh -huh. And those two were at the same. Then I got like a mirror and stuff. Did you come like, here often? No, it's my first time. Why don't you just roll them? We don't want to scratch them. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what's, it, what's they going to go on? El Camino. 68 El Camino. You're happy to be <laughs> here today. <laughs> Would you kind of just get dragged along yeah. to carry? Yeah. yeah. To carry, right? Not your idea of a fun day out. <laughs> no, it's fun. Okay. It's fun. As long as they give you a nice cold beer at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or something else. When asked what? <laughs> it's a family show. <laughs> We've got a feral selection here, haven't you? Yeah. What's it all for? Uh, I'm building a uh, V8 engine sand buggy. And I needed a variety of carburetors for different different driving places. That sounds amazing. So they're all going to be on the same car? Yeah, at different times. Wow. Some of them are just for spare parts. That sounds pretty specialized. Did you have to look around and yeah. hustle to get the right pieces? Yeah. Yeah. Do a lot of bargaining, a lot of looking. Is it tough? No, if you know what you're looking for, you bring... I brought a piece of paper with the right part numbers I needed and just started looking. All right, would the dealers take advantage of you if you didn't really know what you were yes, after? Yes, they will. All in all, a terrific day out. And if you're planning a California holiday, it's well worth fitting in a swap meet side trip. But remember, watch out for that excess baggage bill. They're both Mazda Miatas, MX-5s to us, but despite the mean-looking curves here or there, they're still way too cute to be called monsters, aren't they? Nicky Fox went to California to check out the Monster Miatas, the Cobra for the 90s, the wimp who was taken to the gym and given muscles. This one's been dreamed up by Monster Motorsports of Tuscadito, California, who like to rebuild cars in more interesting ways. So the idea was, well, can we get a 302 Ford engine out of a Mustang in a Miata? And I thought that was crazy, of course, it'll never fit. And I persuaded a friend of mine who had a Miata to uh, let me tear his car apart and see if the V8 would fit in it, and luckily it did, in fact, fit. The first car was finished in late 91, and since that time we've built about 83 cars, including nine Mega Monsters, which are the supercharged version. I met Carol Shelby at one of the Cobra events at Willow Springs Raceway, which 
we took a couple of our V8 monsters too, and he did come over and look at the car and said, oh, that's very neat. Um, I haven't really sat down and talked to him to ask him, but he's got to love the idea, uh, which was his idea, and that is lots of horsepower and a light little car. And this being California, the cars come in matching his and hers versions too, just as well it seems. It was called yeah. keeping our marriage together. <laughs> we had a uh, 93 RX-7, yeah. and that was Bill's, and uh, he liked it a lot until we came down here and drove one of these, and then we got one of these for me, and then I couldn't get him out of mine, so it was a matter of get your own or I leave, and so yeah. he got oh, yeah, his own. Baby. It worked. Yeah. Unofficially, Mazda thinks the monster works too, though most factory parts are replaced. From a world-class T5 transmission, through a strengthened frame and wider wheels, to a limited slip differential. Test driver Martin Wilson reckons it's easy. Really not that difficult. We get the engine and all the drivetrain hooked up, we change the suspension, we have our custom springs in the front, um, we take the front springs and put them into the back, and then it's time for my favorite, the, the test miles. Not to 60 in 3.9. You get the idea. And he'll not keep his license long either, unless he's a cop, of course. The fun about the uh, monster is, uh, for instance, I went up to Monterey on a trip and came back on the Pacific Coast Highway, which is a beautiful highway, and just got behind a 928 Porsche and absolutely wrecked his day because I never passed him. So all he saw was a monster Miata or a Miata behind him, and he couldn't get rid of it. And he did everything he possibly could. He was hitting 140 miles an hour. He was uh, jumping in and out. And every time he looked in his rearview mirror, I was right there. And I just stayed there for about 40 minutes. And then I pulled off on the side of the road and let him go. And I know he was back on his way to the Porsche dealership to find out what was wrong with his car. Now, for everyone in Britain who's just drooling over these cars, I know you're not doing right-hand drive versions at the moment. But what hope is there for somebody who wants the feel or the look of a monster? Well, what we're going to start doing, and we're working on one right now, which is next to me, is a car that still has the four-cylinder Mazda engine, but has the body panels of our Mega Monster, which is the flares, the front and rear spoiler, wider wheels and tires, bigger brakes. So they've got the aggressive look of the Mega Monster without having to go to the V8 power. And you can either, either leave it normally aspirated or turbocharge or supercharge the four-cylinder. So I think that's a good compromise to get the look of a monster without having to put the V8 in it. In California, they know their cars, and this little monster's had more rave reviews than any other we've featured. I don't need any more convincing. All I need is a Porsche driver to annoy. Racing cars that run on electricity? Only in America could a bunch of lead-acid fans get together determined to show the world you can build electric cars that leave the milk float image behind. I have an electric race car, Snow White. It does 140 to 150 miles an hour. The smoke the tires you know, up to 80 to 90 miles an hour. And I can race the thing in the sports car events. They put me in a class where I need to race against formula cars with wings and superchargers. The fastest class there is is where they put me in. Take a big block Corvette, the 500 inch Corvette, put a tube chassis in it, 12 inch wide racing slicks, and it'll blow its wheels off. There's no gasoline car street legal that can keep up with it. It's at 60 miles an hour, you hit the throttle, it, it's, it snaps your neck. It's painful to drive the thing, it's that fast. What distinguishes electric performance vehicles from the boring sort is the latest technology. And in Silicon Valley, one backstreet laboratory is aiming for pole position. The controller is what makes the difference between a golf cart and a race car on these electric cars. This one here will do 0 to 60 miles an hour in 3 seconds. Really? While this one here is more of an ordinary controller and speed and it might do 20 seconds or so in an ordinary car. So is this an ordinary on-the-road electric vehicle? Actually it's purely made as a test bed and done a few other things to make it easier for testing, put in a lot of instrumentation. 
Our, our main role here is to abuse the components the best we can. We figure if they do not break on this vehicle, then they'll hold up well in an ordinary electric car. The experiments continue on the street. This car is a Porsche 914. It has been converted to electric. It has been raced at the Phoenix Solar Electric 500 for about three or four years in a row and is placed either second or third. What kind of speeds do you get to? Well, if you promise not to tell the cops, 95 on Bayshore, 101. And uh, when it was originally built, they had it close to 100. So this one can really move out. We're It is an acronym. It stands for Women's Electric Racing Education International Team. We're It, and we're all women, and we converted this rabbit, and um, it's nicknamed Hoplong, and it's all women built, and um, it's 10, 12 volt batteries, and we raced it in Phoenix in March at the Electric 500, and it's now a commuter car, and it's our special baby. Californian commitment means that even British classics get the electric treatment. This car was donated to a local environmental group on the stipulation that it be converted to electric. So that started us on finding out about electric cars and how to put it all together and make one work. I had been thinking about doing an electric conversion, so I talked to some people and they told me, yeah, it's possible to do it. And Being a backyard mechanic, I figured, all right, I'll try. And I bet you thought you were the only one on the block, didn't you? Uh, actually, yeah, I thought I might have had something unique here with, uh, with this one. As it turned out, there was another electric sunbeam that was actually built before this one, not eight blocks from where I live. Mike, there's something strange about this. There are no batteries. No, this car, we decided to put the batteries in the back. To, uh, you get tired of working around cramped quarters, so we moved them in the back so we had access to all the different components that are in here uh, for experimental reasons. We like to be able to get in here and play with this car a little bit. I don't buy gas for this car. That's what you use for this car. <laughs> But there are serious electric commuters already committed to seeking the cleaner future that we hope awaits us all. Why did you go electric? For my kind of driving, which is a lot of short trips during the day and uh, going to work and then from work to meetings, and it just made sense to me to, to use an electric car. Um, what about speed and range? The top speed of this particular car is 65 miles an hour. The total range on this car is uh, about 60 miles. It drops a little bit during the winter. The batteries are cold, you don't get as much range. So this one was a conversion that you had done? This one uh, was a conversion that was done for Robin Williams' wife. I uh, found it out on the internet. They actually had uh, six cars listed at U.S. Electric Car. So we bought it for $15,000 with 6,700 miles on it. But of course, electric commuters need electric employees' car parks. Patty, what does your job involve as part of the commute department? We have a air quality standard that we have to adhere, adhere to, and in that we have to reduce the number of cars and people driving alone to work. And what are you doing for electric vehicle owners specifically? For electric vehicle owners, we provide outlets for them to plug into that they can recharge their vehicle during the day. Electric vehicles come in all shapes and sizes, but most of them represent the essence of sober practicality. But in California, as with most things, if it's worth doing, it's worth going too far. <coughs> electric supermarket trolley racing and light relief for the electric enthusiasts. The only rule, vehicles must still look a bit like the grocery carts they're based on. And don't worry, those flames are just there for effect. The car isn't just king, but it defined the geography, the culture, the very soul of the place. So I thought the best way to find out what it is that makes Southern Californians tick will be a trip to the new Peterson Museum. And since in LA you are what you drive, I thought I should arrive in style. The Peterson Automotive Museum was initially funded by Robert Peterson, publisher of many American motoring magazines and the delectable exhibits are housed in a former Japanese department store on Wilshire Boulevard. But now it's goodbye bonsai and hello Californian collectibles. Los Angeles is, is uh, we, we consider ourselves and a lot of other people consider ourselves a center for automotive activity and trends and designs and fads and innovations uh, come out of uh, uh, the Southern California area, but particularly Los Angeles area, the hot rodding uh, era of the late 
1940s, early 1950s, all started here in, in Southern California and Los Angeles. Uh, every major automobile manufacturer in the world has a design studio in Southern California, and there's a reason for that. There's a lot of very creative, innovative, uh, technically oriented people here in Southern California. So it's only a natural that uh, Los Angeles would also be uh, putting forth a museum that, that, that is world class to honor the automobile. The other part of it is Los Angeles is a, is a city on wheels. And it's been that way a long time. The displays reflect the fact that, though built on a desert, LA developed the earliest on the road motor culture. 60 years on, it still screams California. This is one new car dealer who can't give you much of an earache. The showroom display changes regularly, so when you visit, it might be 50s Cadillacs on sale. But today, it's 1931 Cords and Auburns. The price now? Win the national lottery, then he'll start talking. We have an embarrassment of riches within 20 miles of the museum. We have a, what is a, a backlog of approximately two years of, of exhibits and automobiles ready to come into the museum when we're ready to, to bring them in, and we're very happy about that. This section's devoted to French styling, but the little Bugattis are completely outshone by the exotic teardrop coupe styled by Fagoni and Falashi. And to think that these Delahays were once laughed at for being weird. Well, call me weird if you like, but this one is mine. Everybody around here has a tale to tell about their own relationship with cars. Tell me a bit about yours. Well, mine is, I grew up with this car right here. I ran this car in the, in the 1960s and early 70s. This car belonged to a very, very good friend of mine who's a very good friend of mine today by the name of Steve Earle. And we used to take this car and race this car. And uh, it was nothing but an old Ferrari race car. And there were new, new Ferrari race cars that were faster and probably handled a little bit, bit better, but nothing as beautiful as this. And we didn't realize at the time that, that a car like this would become such a significant collector item. And it was just another old race car and and what's funny is the way it's all come full circle and now we are all into vintage sports car racing we have been blessed with this museum as uh, sort of our car heaven that we've, we've graduated to, to another level of appreciation of the automobile car heaven inside but a love-hate relationship outside so the Peterson has a little reminder before the journey home Sunday morning in Vista, California, and a scene you'd be unlikely to come across in rural England. The whole town's been closed off to make way for off-road day, and some of the weirdest machines I've ever seen either on or off the road. In Southern California, the automobile's so close to people's hearts that the whole family, in fact the whole town, turns out for an event like this. Our nearest equivalent would be the village fair or the church fete. But when it comes to being California car crazy, we Brits have a long way to go. All the way to California, anyway. When it comes to wacky, we may be no match for the locals, but for people watchers on holiday, I reckon this is a cheaper and more fascinating day out than a theme park. In fact, for motor buffs everywhere, it can be quite an education. Off-roading here isn't just 4x4s in a field, it's rock buggies, swamp buggies, dune buggies, sand rails, quad bikes, midget racers and monster trucks. The only thing that isn't here is a muddy Land Rover. There was one all-American muddy Jeep though. What does mud bog competition mud involve? Mud bog is just nothing but high torque and mud and if you can get whoever gets through the mud the fastest, they, they're the winner. Where have you been in this? Out in the desert near here? They hit like every mud puddle I could from here to the show. If you see them shiny, you know, that's not the way Jeep was made. Jeep didn't, it stands for dirt, mud. Others would disagree. The paint jobs on some of the machinery would have been wasted under all that mud and slime. Gary, these quads are beautiful. How long did it take to build one? This one here took about uh, 30 days. Uh-huh. And what, were the, the, what was the money involved? Uh, this one here with the big motor is about uh, $9,000 dollars in US dollars. They bring me a bike brand new or used, take it all the way down, take every nut and bolt off, chrome every nut and bolt, powder paint the frame, the plastics, build the motor, uh, big motor. Yeah. yeah. What's the power of the motor and oh, what sort of speed can it do? About uh, 80 horsepower and in a quarter mile you can get up to about probably 130, 120 miles an hour. There's no guessing what some of these things are. Just ask. This is a two-seat sand buggy, a custom-made one with all independent suspension on it for a very good ride over the dunes. It has a large 2400cc air-cooled engine in it, 
with the electronic fuel injection on it, a ball bearing turbo, and engine management. Puts out about 400 horsepower. The car weighs about 800 pounds. What sort of events do you do with it? Do you go out just for fun or do you race we it? We just or what? have pure fun. For Ivan Iron Man Stewart, though, it's a very serious business indeed. Ivan Iron Man, tell me how you got your name. Oh, the Iron Man title came from originally years ago. I've been doing this for about off-road racing, desert racing for over 20 years. And the Valvoline Oil Company put up an award called the Iron Man Award to anybody that could draw, drive the whole Baja 1000 or 500, Baja 500, all by themselves, and win, would win this award. So I was the first to do it, the second to do it, the third to do it, and then everybody started calling me, oh, this is the Iron Man of off-road racing. From a thousand mile endurance to a few seconds of airbrushed glory, these are sand dragsters. This one is an alcohol injected turbocharged 2600 cc motor. It puts out right about 750 horse. It's got a, a two-speed tranny with an air shifter in it. And uh, in America, we do 100 yard sand drags. It runs at 96 miles an hour and about three seconds. But the big attraction for the kids of Vista was far less exotic. Not for them all those Technicolor dream machines, but like children everywhere, they just want to be racing drivers when they grow up. What is this kind of car? This car is a Formula Mazda. It's a spec racing car, very similar to uh, Indy Lights um, here in the States, which is just one step under Indy cars, um, where all the cars are uh, made identically and all the engines are prepared by uh, one gentleman who he builds them. So it's not the guy with the most money who wins, it's the best driver. The Vista off-road day is a big success, but how did it all begin? Uh, in the past six years, we've done rod runs with custom rods, uh, street uh, rods, that, and we have over 400 of those uh, street rods roaring into downtown during the day. So we decided to play off of that and do another fun thing, another big boy's toys, and so we decided to do the off-road show. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's obvious off-roading here has very little to do with mud and everything to do with that special brand of showmanship you find nowhere else but in California. Next week, another four-wheel special, looking at the cars of 97.